On today's Motor House, we uncover a rare British sports car and make the tough decision whether to scrap or save this Rover V8 powered Brit Bruiser. Hello everyone and welcome back to Motor House. You join us here at Motor House HQ on a very lovely sunny day, the kind of day as car enthusiasts will dream about. Unfortunately, everything's broken. I owe you all a big apology. Unfortunately, we've not had any videos out for quite a while on the channel. And the reason for that is we have a bit of a car crisis here at Motor House HQ. So today's video is going to be bringing you up to speed and also hopefully showing you how we're going to begin resurrecting a car that's very near and dear to my heart. So what I was really, really hoping I could show you right now was my Porsche 911 Marlena here tickety-boo after having had a lot of money and time spent on the car we've changed all of the suspension we've fitted a new sports exhaust system we've upgraded the gear change we've done lots of important servicing so why why is the car not here well unfortunately the very first test drive in the car I went out and within about 40 miles the engine started misfiring terribly and making an unpleasant rattling sound from the engine which as anyone who owns a Porsche will tell you, noises like that are never cheap. So I've got to find out what's going on with that. What about my Land Rover, Lara here? Well, Lara's working okay. Um, the V8 swap we did a couple of years ago is still working okay. However, the exhaust system has developed a horrendous leak. Um, and some of that is down to the fact that one of the bolts on the cylinder head has stripped its thread so it's not just a simple case of changing the exhaust system so we have problems there hey hey ratchet hi so what's happening in the ratchet fleet then um so i currently have four slash five cars and only one maybe two kind of work yeah it's great isn't it this is exactly what we wanted over the summer obviously we were hoping to take the porsche to the castlecombe track day as you will see um we didn't take a porsche we took uh, dad's mx5 yes which was delightful as i, as I knew it would be yeah i had a lot of fun yeah you had a lot of fun i had I a lot of fun because i was in i was in rexy my crx yeah and both cars broke the gearbox locked up while I was doing 60 miles an hour down a major A road and I did a 25 foot skid to a halt. The length of the skid marks and also the huge amount of traffic buildup that we caused in a, a nice little village. Sorry about that. Yeah, so uh, gearbox C solid. Um, so we'll fill you in on that at some point. So the CRX is kind of out of action. A little bit. Your Jeep My was GP. working well enough for you to be a star of TV the other week, right? Uh, Chelsea in Bloom. Chelsea Flower Show. Yeah, invited me to come down and wanted to use my Jeep in uh, this morning television show. Which car is best car? Danny Jazz's best car, because Danny works. Danny works, um, somehow faultlessly for a 30, how many? 38 year old car. We love this little car. So since you last saw Danny, we've got the spanky Suzuki Ignis Sport Recaros in there now. Yeah. Steering wheel from a Turbo 2. Turbo 2. Because that definitely makes everything faster. Adds at least right. six horsepower. CF48 Mugen alloys that are very dirty and need a refurb with cooling. With cooling. Fins. With cooling fins. Because bigger brakes. Because obviously. bigger brakes on there as well, because obviously 1.2 needs it. Totally. Um, so Danny is working a treat and then also. Hands. Yes. Darling. Best car I've ever bought. How's Hands been working for you? Hands has been. So far, touch wood. Yep. Uh, been great. Like the roof goes down, flippity flop. Flippity flop. I continue to be a massive fan of these first generation SLKs. They are so much car for the money. The sun's shining. We do have one convertible out of our fleet that's working. But how about trying to make that two? So, what's behind the garage door? Well, come with me, dear viewer. Behind door number one, we have a load of crap piled on an old British sports car. Um, <laughs> yay! Whoop, whoop, whoop! Um, this, which you can barely make out, but you can see here, this is a TVR 350i. 
Um, this is genuinely a really rare British sports car. Um, they made less of these than Ferrari F40s. It's that level of, of rare. Um, I've owned this car now for 12 years. Is that right? I think it is 12 years, crikey. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna pull all of this junk off the car, drag her out into the daylight, and we're gonna make an assessment. So uh, what do you reckon, girl? Should we get her out? There we go. It actually looks like a car now. That didn't take too long, did it? So um, come on then, let's show, his, show it off. Show it off? What you got? What you got? Um, well, come in, come in and I'll, I'll show you. So, um, Let's have a quick chat about the car. So TVR, it's a brand that quite a lot of petrol heads know. Um, TVR were based in Blackpool. Um, I call them the Lancashire Lotus, right? Imagine a Lotus that's a bit heavier than it really should be and built worse and you've got a TVR. But the reason why I bought this car all those years ago is because of TVR's decision to install the venerable Rover V8 all aluminium engine. Now, uh, Lotuses of the period usually had um, high revving four cylinder engines that were notoriously fragile and very expensive to rebuild. Um, on the flip side, this engine here um, is exactly as you would have found in a Rover SD1 Vitesse of the early 1980s. So what size is that then? This is three and a half litres. And how many, how many powers does that make? Um, as near as makes no difference, 200 bhp. Mm. So I know there's probably some of our younger viewers going, what, 200 bhp from three and a half litres? And yes, if you've grown up in an era where you're used to twin overhead cam engines and high revving engines you Hello. used to well exactly right so <laughs> the interesting thing is is that this makes a bit more power than one of your 1.6 VTEC Hondas the difference is that this makes the same torque as one of those VTEC Hondas at idle yeah and it probably makes like twice or three times the amount of torque in total yeah yeah just just <laughs> tremendous so and the other thing you've got to remember is because that is such a light engine, because it's an all aluminium V8 from the block, the heads, the lot, this entire car weighs less than 1100 kilos. So the power to weight ratio is fantastic. Um, it's a really exciting car to drive. Unfortunately, there's a load of oil down the back end of the engine. And the problem I was having with this car before I put it away is it kept blowing valley gaskets and it started breathing really heavily. So there was also like a tapping noise coming from the engine and I suspect, I'm only gonna know when I tear this engine down, I suspect we've either got cracked piston rings, damaged piston, or all of the above. Um, so that's why she, one of the reasons she was laid up. Another reason, as you can see, unfortunately, she's a tatty old thing. She was when I bought her back in 2011. Believe it or not, I paid £1,750 for this car back in 2011. Um, the sad thing is, they're still not worth a huge amount of money. What do you think? Should we get her out into the sunshine for the first time in three? Must be before COVID. So yeah, three years. Crikey. Come on then, girl. Let's get her out into the sunshine. Hello, old friend. I haven't seen this shape in quite a while. From this angle, you can now totally see why these are called the Wedge series of TVR. So these cars were styled by the most unbelievably Englishly named Oliver Winterbottom. Yes, that's a real name. Uh, Mr. Winterbottom had formerly worked at Jaguar on a few projects, but was mainly known for being over at Lotus for the Elite Eclat XL, which when you look at those cars, they look very similar. Very wedgy. Very wedgy, right? Very wedgy. It was very much the 70s futurist, brutalist zeitgeist, it right? Of, style at the time. It was in, well, you see, that's the problem. That's why these are the black sheep of the family. Um, 
A chap called Martin Lilly owned TVR at the time in the 1970s. And TVR at the time were making very traditionally styled sports cars, which still look great now, kind of timeless British sports cars. And he decided that what TVR needed to push it forward into the next decade was something bold, something modern, something that really reeked of the future. Unfortunately, by the time the first of the TVR wedges rolled off the production line, that kind of 70s wedge aesthetic was starting to look a bit old. Fashions change. So this was a massive shock to TVR's original clientele. Peter Wheeler, who is the most famous of all the TVR bosses, bought the failed TVR off Martin Lilly. And one of the first things he did was to replace the Ford V6. You could still buy the Ford V6 as an option, but to basically replace it, with the all aluminium Rover V8 engine, which absolutely transformed the car. And from that point on, TVR has a reputation of making cars with big, loud, larry, powerful engines was born. So, cars that will kill you. This will kill you, even with only 200 bhp. Believe me, if you mistreat this, it will bite, and it will bite really hard. So, um, obviously what I'm gonna do is look at fitting a more powerful engine into it. Shall we have a look at what engines I've got under the bench and make a decision? Um, I've got two Rover V8s under the bench here in various states of also buggeredness. The, the keen-eyed amongst you will note that this one is in like a duck egg blue, would you call that duck egg blue? Yeah, kind of like a green. Yeah. So this is a military reconditioned Rover V8 engine. Um, a testament to the versatility of these engines is that they were used in everything from sports cars to this actually came out of an armoured snatch Land Rover that was in Afghanistan. And I know it was in Afghanistan because when I started to strip it down I found sand in the valley of the engine. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. Um, unfortunately, when we started it up, this too had a top end rattle from it which I'm fairly certain is a faulty cam bearing at the back of the engine. With this being an ex-military engine, this is a what's called a low compression three and a half liter engine. There's huge differences in power outputs depending on the spec of the engine. A low comp engine like this was designed for basically being driven flat out everywhere on low grade petrol. So this made a whopping 135 horsepower, but theoretically would do that having the absolute nuts ragged off it all day long. While which is running on chicken. While running on oil, something right? wet and <laughs> burns, right? So that's what you want with a military engine. Not what you want in a sports car. I've got another engine that's actually in storage. I've got a low mileage 4.6 out of a P38 Range Rover. I quite like the idea of fitting that. What do you reckon, Ratchet? I think you'll die. <laughs> and I, as much as I'd like to inherit all of your broken cars, <laughs> I'd also quite like having a boyfriend. I've already stripped this. This is a 3.9 litre Rover V8 that um, came out of a classic Range Rover. These are beautiful, beautiful engines. It's the same stroke as a 3.5 litre Rover V8 that's in there, but they increased the bores. Instantly you get more power, you get more torque, but by virtue of the fact that it's still um, uh, a short stroke engine, um, this will still rev hard. So this is the sweet spot. We've got the, the cooking utilitary 3.5 there. There's the torque monster 4.6 over in storage. This 3.9 would be a really nice sweet spot. Now we could rebuild the 3.5 that's in there. That's totally an option. Um, but it costs the exact same amount of money to rebuild a 3.5 as it does a 3.9. So why not go for a bit more extra power at the same time? So thankfully, with Ratchet being a professional engineer, she's okay. brought a raft of uh, measuring oh, tools, instruments, so on. We are going to assess this block 
and see what it needs for rebuilding. We're gonna have a quick measure of the bores, check a few things out. All the pistons and rods are here. Um, we're gonna do that off camera. So we will see you in a minute, hopefully, when we've got some idea of, is this rebuildable? Is it worth getting the TVR back on the road? Am I gonna have a V8 sports car for the summer? So then, much measurement has been done. Here's the engine block. Here's a crankshaft. Here's a ratchet. There you go. So, new experience this one. We've never actually done any precision measuring of engine blocks before, have I know. we? 20, 20 odd years of being a mechanical engineer. Yeah. And uh, also a similar amount of time messing around on cars. And I've never done this on an engine. It's a sign of the times, people, but these cars and, and engines are getting rarer and more expensive to buy second hand. And so this is the problem, is that this was a complete engine you know? that we were sold as being a good running engine. Mm. However, the figures tell another story, don't yeah, they? It's kind of worn. So going over to that, that I think that that is that is the key word really. It's worn out. Worn out. Yeah, it's, it's just worn it's out. It's had a life. So, um, arrived in the post today is Land Rover's official workshop manual on the Rover V8 engines. So this is the official publication with all the stats in. This gives you the crucial information which tells you about clearances, how much things are permitted to wear, um, and we've been doing lots and lots of measurements and, and this is, you'll see there's a load of numbers on the board. These all point to a very worn engine. So, Ratchet, explain these for the people at home. Okay, so cylinder one, yep. um, we, as per the book, measured about two inches into each cylinder bore. So we were taking that as a vertical yep. and that as a horizontal. Because that's the thrust plane, isn't it? As the piston yeah, comes kind up. Yeah, and of, I mean, yeah. sort of about, about to I mean, you yeah. shouldn't really be putting fingerprints in, to be quite but honest. It really ain't going to make it's a difference not really on this engine. But yeah, to about sort yeah. of there, yeah. two inches in. And then using that to kind of work out like how oval instead of yeah. round. So this be being turned. a 3.9 litre engine, the standard. standard bore is 94 yeah. millimetres. Now, Land Rover say that you're allowed a maximum ovality of 0 0.013. So that means that when they were brand new, the <coughs> cylinder balls would be perfectly circular. With age, with that piston working up and down, it kind of just opens the bore up a little bit. Nothing you would ever see with the eye. No, I mean, as, as you pointed out, that's 0.013 of a millimeter. Yeah. Not a centimeter, not a decimeter, not a yep. meter, exactly. a millimeter. That's a, a very small amount. So, <laughs> but also a big amount. So Ratchet has worked out the difference between the two, and as so, you can see, unfortunately. Measurement, yeah. one, vertical, yeah. horizontal, yeah. and that's your difference in ovality in yeah. blue. And you can see as we go down, the maximum <laughs> you're allowed is 0 0.013, yeah. and it ain't. So like, yeah. that's kind of okay, that's that okay. Been okay. Mm, borderline, not great. Yeah. Pretty shagged. Really? I was saying, oh, that is, 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 does that keep it PG 13? Yeah, not? that's fine. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's like double what it should be. Yeah, exactly. So those would be borderline. If it was a low stress environment, you might suck it and see. But then the next crucial one is I mean, this for me is the, this is the absolutely crucial one tap, 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 which is the piston to cylinder clearance. Okay. If that's too big, your engine's going to burn oil, it's going to have bad compression, it's just bad, bad, bad. So the magic figure there is 0 0.002 to 0 0.045. We have measured all of the pistons in the box. Pull the piston out, right? Okay. And where the workshop manual tells you to measure is... Is... Again, it's not really going to matter yeah. too much. So, um, this is the skirt. Yep. So it's a, and that's called the Gudgeon pin, which mm -hmm. connects your your Cord. rod, yeah, your con yeah. rod to the actual piston itself. Yeah. And as you can see, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that. Um, so it says to do it 90 degrees to the Gudgeon pin and about, about 10, 10 mil from up the end of the, from the bottom. Skirt, so yeah, yeah. kind of about there yeah. across. 
across and across, across. There. So that's, yeah that's across what we're there. trying to do so we've done that we've got those measurements do the it. maximum that you're allowed is 0.002 to 0.045 figures are not good are they so that's the measurement that we took across and we basically decide to take the maximum of each yeah. of the two let's go worst case scenario yeah and yeah. then work out that from that yep gives you that 065 so that's knacked mm, that, that's okay that's okay that is very shallow. super knacked that's even more knacked yeah that's okay that's not great that's not great that's not great <laughs> so we've got one I think. so yeah one. there's one yeah one now, the numbers and the figures there tell you one story, but you can use your eyes to tell something else too. So, you can probably see is that just here it has a brownish coloration to it. That's the copper backing of these bearings. And you can see is where it is. It means that as that has worked back and forth on the on the crankshaft here is that this bearing material has worked away until it's down to the copper backing when it decides to focus so there's a very obvious visual sign that things aren't brilliant these are the cylinder balls it's a little bit tricky to show um, but some of these have got let me see if I can show it you might just be able to see it there is that there are scoring lines in the ball and this one's really bad um, this kind of winds me up really if you take care of an engine that really shouldn't happen. But scoring like that is usually attributable to... Ragging it from cold. Ragging it from cold, not yeah. letting the engine warm up yeah. properly. And skipping oil changes, and, and honestly from the state of the camshaft and everything that came out of this, this poor, lovely Rover V839 engine uh, did not end its life in a particularly nice way. Now this isn't the crankshaft that came out of the engine, I bought a job lot of Rover V8 parts a couple of years back and this was chucked in there and I was told that this was a reconditioned crankshaft. Um, we've had a very quick measure on this and interestingly it doesn't look like it's actually been ground under size, I wonder if this just had a polish. But either way, we may, we may have a crank that is good to go in there. We got some thinking to do. Yes, and I feel like in future I need a lab coat. I think you do need a lab coat. Professor Ratchet will see you now. So, from me the Bob. And me the Ratchet. It's goodbye from us, and goodbye from another episode of... Motorhouse! Motor